So the, the, the prayer picture that I've had for quite some time after hearing that is whether I'm praying for myself or praying for other people, is to consider the Lord Jesus with his nail-pierced hands, putting his hand on whatever part of your life is the most deeply wounded, and to know that in that place of union, of his brokenness and our brokenness, that his life, his Holy Spirit, his goodness, can flow into us. And that's where we find our healing and restoration. Good morning. Um, please feel free to, to take a seat. Um, I'd like to simply begin by thanking you for the opportunity to come and, and share the word and, and, and especially thank you to Gavin um, for, um, for that passion, um, spirit-filled prayer for our family and for me this morning. In a sense, I feel like enough said, um, but because he prayed for my preaching, I, I, I give God the opportunity to answer that. Um, I also want to do something that I didn't plan on saying, but in, in the spirit of, of Pentecost Sunday, just to, to help us see a little bit of a visual picture. I really like that, that, that picture of the people with the flames on their head and, um, well, you know, that, those tongues of fire. And I just wanted to draw a little bit of a biblical theology around that uh, very quickly for you. So um, if you kind of know the, the story of the Bible, when God called the people of Israel out of uh, Egypt, and he, and he created a law and essentially created a culture through which he could be made known. He gave very specific instructions for building the tabernacle. And when they consecrated that tabernacle, fire from heaven filled the place. Um, and if you fast forward a little bit to Solomon building the temple and consecrating that temple in the same way, fire filled the temple um, as the Spirit of God made that place, the place where heaven and earth meet. And then, you know, the people of Israel disobeyed and were exiled. The temple was destroyed. Um, God called a group of people to come back and to rebuild the temple. There's something conspicuously absent in that movement, that the fire from heaven did not fill that second temple as it did the tabernacle and as it did the original Solomon's temple. And then the beautiful, beautiful thing that you see in John 1 is that the word became flesh and pitched his tent, literally tabernacled among us. And we don't see necessarily a flame of fire in that place. But after Jesus' life, his death, his burial and resurrection, the next place in the biblical story you see this picture of flames is not on a building, but it's on the people of God setting us apart to be the place where heaven and earth meet. Not just so we can personally connect with God, but so others can see the presence of God, and come to know who God is. God set us apart for that. And that's what that beautiful picture of fire, I believe, is all about. It's the meeting of heaven and earth um, in, in and through our lives. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so with an abrupt and maybe a little bit disjointed uh, transition, um, we have been in this series called Fruitful for the last couple of months. It's a little bit um, bo been broken on and off with Easter in between and things along those lines. Um, it's been a book, it's been a series that's largely based on Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. Um, it has been the starting point of many of the messages. Um, so so far, we have looked at the discipline of celebration, worship, confession, solitude, study, simplicity, and prayer. And just as a reminder, on top of several reminders, these aren't disciplines or works that somehow get us to gain favor with God. And even just that little, the little bit that I just said there, I hope, hope to understand that it's God that is making the way to be with us. They're not disciplines or works to gain favor, not practices that will somehow get us out of trouble, um, but they're practices that help us, help us orient ourselves and our whole lives to the reality of who we are in Christ. John 15.4 has been the foundational passage that grounds each of these messages and each of these practices, um, where Jesus said, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, 
And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. John 15, 4. So this morning, I'm actually not going to be sharing from one of the disciplines in the Celebration of Discipline book. But I'll be wrapping up the series. Um, so this is the last of the, the fruitful series, and we're looking forward to Pastor Nathan um, back in the pulpit next week. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be sharing a what I'm calling a discipline, but it might um, startle you a little bit, um, the discipline of faith. Um, and so if you've, been, if you've spent any time in the Christian church, um, you might have a couple of alarm bells going off. How can you call faith a discipline? How can you call faith, uh, you know, a work? Um, and, and I'd agree, of course, with that, that, that sort of immediate gut reaction um, objection. I'm not saying that you can work your way into the kingdom of heaven or that we can do something sort of good enough to remove the consequences of our own inaction, action, and sin. But Jesus, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have any problem connecting faith um, and discipline or faith and work uh, together. So in John 6, this is a story that happens after um, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus says this. And the people are looking for Jesus and, and wanting to have something to do with him. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures into eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So they asked, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. Does Jesus mean that we can just sort of, if we say a prayer or, or tick a box or say, I believe something about the past, um, God's work in the past, that somehow that is a work that we can do that, that sort of makes faith um, invalid? I don't think that that keeps in context with what the whole Bible teaches, really. But I think what Jesus is asking us to do is to really grapple with the, with the reality that he himself is the fullness of the expression of who God is. And Jesus is the full expression of what it means to be human. So what I'm, what I'm talking about by asking us to believe that he is the one that God sent um, that he's asking us to do these two things. And, he, and in doing so, he's challenging us to believe and to trust that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And to challenge us to orient ourselves, the entirety of who we are, towards him as the embodiment of life, real life, eternal life, the life in abundance that he promises. So what I mean by faith this morning um, is that Jesus is our vision, our dream of reality that we um, orient ourselves around. And it's this type of faith that everybody has, um, whether it's in Jesus or, or something else. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but every, every human, by one way or another, lives by faith, lives by a vision of the good that orients all of our lives. Um, a little bit of what I'm saying, if you want a quick book recommendation that's not in a slide or anything like that, um, is a book called You Are What You Love. Um, so just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, that shaped my thinking a little bit. So I'd pass that on so you can at least see that I'm not just off of my own. Um, so when Jesus says the work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent, I believe that he's saying to build, for, he's challenging us to build our lives around him in him and through him. Or as he put it in another passage, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Or as the author of the book of Hebrews says in chapter 12, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We might think that remain is like a passive type of a thing um, and, until you, you know that it takes some strength for a palm tree to, to remain in the ground in the face of a cyclone, doesn't it? Um, and so, that, so what I'm talking about is the active seeking after God, and that's what I mean um, by faith this morning. But there are plenty of alternative, alternative visions for the good life, isn't there? 
objects of faith that call out to us to orient ourselves around them. Um, it's true for us individually. It's also true for us as cu culturally speaking. I think that's actually what binds the culture together is a shared vision of what is good and an orientation towards that. Um, I have in my wallet, but I didn't bring it up with me because I emptied out my pockets, um, a little official document um, from, from the lotto. And it has Thursday's winning numbers on it for $100 million. Now, before you think that I have the winning ticket, this is just a, a, a report of the winning numbers um, because I didn't um, play into it. But I think, I think it's a, actually a good symbol of what binds our hearts together as a culture, generally speaking in the West, towards the good life. I don't necessarily mean the get-rich-quick sort of, sort of thing that it symbolizes. Um, but the thing that it symbolizes is actually in the rules, or sorry, actually in the, the advertising from the lotto here in Australia, um, to play by your own rules. Um, and that's, that's what it, what's at the heart of our culture, isn't it? Um, be your own person. Play by your own rules. Don't let society dictate who you are. Break free from all constraints. Tell your story. Live your, live your life. Live your dream. Determine your identity no matter what. Or to quote a philosopher um, from Disney, uh, let it go. Um, I've heard somebody sing that before. I'm not going to attempt. Um, as a little side note, just about that whole sort of um, be your own boss, you know, live your own life, play by your own rules. Um, I, I, there's a part of me that wants to challenge the lottery on this because if I can play by my own rules, I'm just going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, here's my bank details to pay off my mortgage, please and thank you. Um, but of course, that's not what he means. They, they mean, is it? I mean, actually, play by our rules so we can live our version of the best life. For, so you can have the, the, the multi-minuscule chance of, of possibly living your, your life, right? And so whether it's, so just as a, a little discernment side, when anybody's telling you, do your own thing, it usually, most of the time, whether it's the serpent in Genesis 3 um, or, the, or the people, um, you know, wanting you to buy lottery tickets, um, usually means we want you to do our thing. Um, Nevertheless, it's something, even, even knowing that, it's something that grabs our attention, doesn't it? I mean, maybe you're driving down the road and you see, ooh, 100 million, ooh, 150 million. Um, my mom used to, to, she still does actually, um, have, have us play a game, the lottery game. What if? What if we had all of this money? What would we do? Um, what would we do? How would we spend it? You know, and all this sort of things. Um, how are we going to live if this were true? Um, and I've completely lost my place, but I'll, I'll pick it up somewhere along the lines. And I think, you know, you know, vacation, art, whatever people sort of picture, I think there's probably a Christian version of that too, isn't there? Like, oh, imagine the tithe, um, <laughs> you know. Um, and you could sort of talk yourself into, oh, I'd be a really, really good and faithful Christian. I could, I could pay off the... Uh, I could pay off the, the debt for the, for the next gen building. We could plant a couple new churches. Oh, the mission budget, it would be super, you know, and all of this. But I think it, at the heart of even the, the sort of the Christian version of winning the lottery, um, when I examine my own heart, what I see is I want all the riches of following God. I want all the riches of blessing from God. I want all of the goodness, and I even want to serve him. But I don't really want to depend on him for my daily needs. That's, that's what I see in myself. I don't, know if, I don't know if that's true for anybody else. I could be just, you know, <laughs> wacky. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's the thing. We, we want abundance so we can give out of our abundance. But what I'm hoping that we get to today, that God is abundantly good and beautiful and that we can depend on him for our day-to-day -day needs. And, he, and, and in that, we can grow in him and remain in him. How we'll, we'll go about this morning is to, is to centrally look at the trustworthiness of God and how he's revealed himself through the passages of Scripture. And, and basically I'm saying if God is so beautiful, if God is so good, if God is so rich in mercy, um, there's, a, there's an easy, que obvious question. Then why is there so much pain? 
and, and how, do we, how do we deal with the pain in our lives and the reality of, of deep wounds um, and to see how remaining in Jesus um, is that. But then to take then a step forward to think about how then can we live a fruitful life? So let me pray um, after I, you know, I'm done with my long introduction now. Um, Father, uh, you are holy and wholly good. We acknowledge that you, when your will is done, that there is light, life, and goodness in all of creation. So we pray this morning, your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives and those around us and even among all people. So we pray this morning that you will feed us in your word that we might live and walk in your grace, receiving and sharing it. Um, I don't want there to be less of us, but there would, we would be more transformed to be more like you. Um, but, but so that we be, may be made more like you. <laughs> that we might walk in the salvation that you have provided in Jesus and be drawn close to him by your spirit. Um, we receive again your spirit that we might uh, represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we, as we consider our faith um, and in the faithfulness of God, I want to do something that, quite frankly, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with. Um, but I think it's got good biblical roots here. If we turn to Psalm 136 in verse 1, it's a, it's a fairly unique psalm. It starts off with this verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Um, then that psalm continues on. Each verse tells something about the good works of God and has a refrain of his mercy endures forever. And so this morning, and I believe that that's set up to be a call and response. It's an interactive type of worship where the person leading, and this today it happens to be me, says the Lord is good. And I'm going to invite you not to say his mercy endures forever, but to say his love is unstoppable. And the reason why I want you to, I'll call out the Lord is good, and I want you to say the Lord, is, his love is unstoppable. Um, because you know the verse that Jesus said that, the, that based this gospel, this is the gospel when he was talking to Peter, and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. We have, we have a friend who is from um, one of the countries that makes the top 10 list of persecuted countries around the world. And to hear his testimony of how God is just breaking through all of the resistance that the people in power can put up to bring life into a place where it's illegal to follow him. God's love is unstoppable. And as we consider his works through history, that we do so in a way that, that, that helps us to really invite ourselves into that. So let's do a practice run. If this is somehow triggering for you, you don't have to say it, but you know, if you believe it, say it with me. Um, give thank, uh, the Lord is good. His love is unstoppable. All right. Very good. I don't even have to make you do it again. <laughs> so, um, God, who exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect community, perfect and complete love, the essence and definition of goodness, a perfect culture, if you will, out of the overflow of God's own love and goodness, decided to create. And he created a world and a, and a universe that is good and beautiful. If you've looked at the, the pictures of the auroras that were all over the internet last year, like, I want to see those. Like, that's just like a drop in the bucket compared to the beauty of what God has created. God, and he made it to be very, very good. The Lord is good. Excellent. Um, the Lord crowned his creation by creating humanity to be embodied images and reflections of God's own being, to be embodied reflections of God's own character, to govern and steward God's creation so his love and goodness would cover the earth through his image bearers. The Lord is good. Love is unstoppable. The Lord didn't create robots or something like AI that could only obey him, but beings who could trust him and fulfill the Lord's purpose by freely trusting him, by turning away, um, and allowing us to do so even at the, a very deep and personal cost to himself. The Lord is good. When the Lord grieved when he saw what he saw humanity doing to one another, 
Um, and there's a, there's a key verse in, in the flood narrative that God foresaw, foresaw the destruction of humanity. I think we are coming to a place of complete annihilation, self-involved. He rescued humanity by choosing Noah to build an ark to rescue humanity and animals from his act of recreation. The Lord is good. When humanity united in rebellion and disobedience to make ourselves great, God descended and he facilitated our spread over the earth, confusing our languages. As such, God essentially helped us form various cultures who would reflect the Lord's goodness in various and unique ways. The Lord is good. But the Lord did not leave us to our own to blindly grope, but he chose a family through whom he would make himself known. The Lord is good. He rescued this family from slavery and oppression in, in Egypt. He shepherded them to a land that he promised to their father Abraham. He did everything possible to establish them as his people so they could be a light to the nations. He made them to be a people with a culture that demonstra to demonstrate what it looks like when a people live a fruitful life with the Lord as their center. He gave them history and practices and laws, all towards pointing to him as the center of life and true blessing and goodness, that through him all people might know who God is. The Lord is good. Despite Israel's constant failure to honor the Lord and represent him well to the nations, the Lord continually pursued his people for good even as he allowed the consequences of generations of sin and failure to overtake the people and he removed them from the promised land. He continued to reach out to them in love and in grace and even restored a portion of his people from exile so he could fulfill his plan in and through them. Through all of this, he revealed the nature of the human heart and God's own heart and purpose to love and restore his people to life and himself. The Lord is good. The Lord himself, the word and heart of God, knowing and having displayed that humanity could not fulfill God's given purpose for us, took it upon himself to do it. The word became flesh, as I mentioned before, tabernacled with us. The Lord took up our humanity to live a life of faithfulness to the Father, of complete alignment to his life within the goodness of God. He also took upon himself the consequences of our failure to live life in faithful alignment to fail to live life in faithful alignment with God. And his alignment with his Father's goodness won, and he overcame sin and death by being raised to eternal life as the first fruit of the new creation. The Lord is good. Is Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the Lord fulfilled his plan for uh, the people of Israel and made it possible for people from any tongue, tribe, and nation to become the children of God to receive his new life, to receive his spirit, to become the people through which he would make himself known to all peoples. The Lord is good. He left us the Bible. He left us the scripture to demonstrate what it's like for all peoples from all cultures to come to him. The Lord is good. The Lord has shown to us that he will eventually return bringing all of the goodness of God down to earth, that the heavens and earth will be, des uh, will be, des will be um, recreated, if you will, uh, then to be finally, as his people, um, full, abundant, complete, and good, uh, and have the eternal life, and in a new creation in such a way that there will be no more tears, suffering, and death. The future that we have in store for us makes the winning lottery ticket look like nothing. Make it looks like smoke, ash, vapor compared to the goodness of God that we have waiting in store for us. The Lord is good. So if we have this beautiful, loving God that's unstoppable, what do we do with, with the brokenness in our own lives? How do we, how do we reconcile that, the, the picture of, of the beauty and the grace of who God is and how he's revealed himself with the reality of, of, of pain and brokenness in our own lives. Um, we've looked at the faith and faithful, faith in the faithfulness of God, and I pray and I trust that whether it's for the first time that you consider 
the Lord Jesus worthy of your whole life, or if you've been living with that as a, as a faith reality, but tangled up in the weeds, to really consider um, how prayer can shape how you move forward in that. And I'll invite you to pray later. But our faith also brings healing and restoration. And I'd like to return to the verse that, that this is all, um, that this whole series has been built on. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot bear fruit, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Um, Paul has similar language in the book of Romans where he said, for you speaking to the nations, speaking to us, as it were, we're by nature a wild olive tree and are grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. So um, if we can go to the, the picture of the, the fruitful, uh, yeah, exactly. So something that I learned in a book about 20 odd years ago that is just stuck with me um, for a long time was from a theologian that was hundreds of years before speaking about the vine and the branches. If we can imagine that we are one of these sort of dead and dangling um, or, or branches sticking up with, with no life on it, how is it that we can move from this side of the picture, as it were, to this fruitful side of the picture? What needs to happen in the very basics of gardening for that to happen? Um, it's very obvious once I say it, but it wasn't something that I saw until somebody said it for me. Both need to be broken. In order for something to be moved from a dead, dying, decaying branch, in order to, to be moved over to a life-giving vine, the join needs to happen where there's, mute, where there's brokenness. There's brokenness all over our, in our lives and in our heart and in our reality. The brokenness of sin is pretty easy to find on this side. But Jesus also was broken on our behalf so that we could be grafted into the life of God. And, and it's, it's actually at that place of the deepest pain in our life that he invites us into his life. So the, the, the prayer picture that I've had for quite some time after hearing that is whether I'm praying for myself or praying for other people, and we'll do that later on, is to consider the Lord Jesus with his nail-pierced hands, putting his hand on whatever part of your life is the most deeply wounded, and to know that in that place of union, of his brokenness and our brokenness, that his life, his Holy Spirit, his goodness can flow into us. And that's where we find our healing and restoration. I think this is something that Paul is getting at when we are most weak, God is most strong. And so, um, personally, in my life, um, uh, I'll say something else and then I'll talk to the pers personal side. Uh, more often than not, however, instead of letting our wounds be open, um, we tend to hide them, don't we? Um, we, we would rather... Um, Rather than being open to the Lord's hand and work in our life, we can tend to resist it. Growing scabs, scar tissue, and calluses around our vulnerability. Rather than seeing the Lord's power in our weakness, we become the proverbial hurt person. Hurt person who hurts other people. In this case, um, the, the, the faith risk, if you will, that I ask you, all of us to take is to um, let the Lord cut those calluses away that he might be able to, to touch us in the place we're wounded. For me, this has is, this is meant making myself open to the Lord in a deeply personal way and striving to trust him with my whole self. When I was young, I, was, um, I won't go into details or anything like that, but, but hurt pretty badly by a couple of other people. Um, after which it felt like, the only way I can explain sort of the, my, the reality is it felt like a, a sucker punch to the soul. Like somebody literally took a vacuum and took my voice away. Um, and so when I, when I grow callous, when I, when, I, when I fear vulnerability, um, rather than being able to speak the truth in love, I retreat. Um, 
But when I'm mindful of the Lord's grace and goodness and actively trust him, I can say, Lord, let your word be my voice. Or with Moses and the psalmist, I can say, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. That the Lord can not only help me speak, but to sing, and to sing his beauty and his praise and his grace. I'd imagine I'm, I'm not the only person in the room that's been deeply hurt or, or hurt others. Um, the, the author of Ecclesiastes, and I think this undergirds a lot of the pain in the world, um, has said, he has set eternity in the human heart. Um, and more often than not, we experience this eternalness as a void, an emptiness, a deep loneliness that we try to fill up with things that can never satisfy. Uh, all of the food in the world can't ever satisfy our deepest hunger. Um, all the earthly experiences, our physical pleasures, um, will never satisfy our need, our deep eternal need um, for intimacy. All of the riches in the world, all of the consumer goods will never feel the, find, fill that eternal need to experience life and be satisfied. Social media won't validate anyone more than the love and acceptance of the Father. Drugs, alcohol, travel, shopping, experience, wealth, or any other created thing can never make us whole. But it is quite sad when we try to fill our lives with that which won't ever satisfy as Augustine wrote so many years ago, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We are empty unless God fills us. But we need to be open and trusting with the Lord to expose our deepest self to him in prayer, or at least sharing what scar tissue is getting in the way, and invite him to reach out with his nail-pierced hands to bring in his healing salve of his spirit into our whole selves. And when we have connected with the Lord Jesus in this way and remain in him as recipients of his grace, we can then in turn become channels of grace and love and fulfill his purpose for us as individuals, as families, and as a community of faith. Our faith is in the faithfulness and the goodness of God. That connection with the Lord Jesus is which brings healing and restoration. And it's also this connection which bears fruit. We have a fruitful calling. God's invited us to a full and abundant life. Whether we're talking about being created in God's image, um, the calling out and the separation of the people of God, the healing and the saving of the people of God and the commissioning of the people of God, all these things have one thing in common. Each work of God in these areas is to form his children to be living embodied reflection of God's goodness and love, his character, his life, and his love. That's what it means to be fruitful, isn't it? To live life in full, in abundance. It's not just the future kingdom which makes the one in lottery look like poverty, um, but we, we already have more than enough in Jesus right here and now. Sometimes it would be easy to say, oh, I'd, I'd be a bit more generous, if only. I'd be a bit fill in the blank, if only I had a little bit more. The reality is, in Jesus, in this moment right now, we have more than we need to live a generous, abundant, and fruitful life. It doesn't necessarily mean out of finances, but the giving of our whole self um, to be more like him. Peter put it this way in 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. He's given us everything we need to live the full life, to fulfill his purpose for us, to be a light to the world, salt of the earth, to be a light to the nations a kingdom of priests, the only body through whom God is revealing God's good news in Jesus to all peoples. Too often we think, oh, it's just for the, for the individuals who might sense a, a, a specific call, but this is our identity as the people of God that binds us all together. Um, 
And it all starts with whether or not we believe God is trustworthy or not. As Mark mentioned um, in the prayer um, sermon uh, several weeks ago now, we can either view God as a dictator, a vending machine, or the faithful, close father. Because if we view him as a dictator, we'll, we'll fake obedience, won't we? We'll, we'll, do, we'll be subversive. We'll just do whatever it is. We'll live in fear. Uh, the vending machine really means I want to live my life my way and, and just you know, count on God to throw me the cha-ching whenever I need it. Um, but the reality is um, our view of God dictates who we, we think he is. And when, he said, when Jesus says to things, things to us like lay your life down, um, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, we can think he's just an impossible God as an overbearing dictator that gives things, you know, commands that we can't do. But when we look at it through the eyes of active faith, we can see that it's an invitation to live in the fullness of who God is in such a way as that we experience that his love is unstoppable. And this is Jesus, isn't it? Jesus so oriented himself to God's overflowing love that nothing could stand against him and move him outside of God's love for and through him. And when we trust in him and let his vision for our goodness and shape our reality, we don't become hollow vessels, but we become like the one we are connected to. When we trust that this is the God who has revealed himself through Jesus and remain in him, orient our whole lives towards him, we become channels of grace. But we're not tubes, we're not hollow vessels. Um, we are changed in on ourselves to be more like Jesus. And we become the channels of grace through which the world will be transformed. That's one of the reasons like, that God has simply called all of us to be a light to the nations. Um, it's also true for those who, call, who feel called out to go and serve God cross-culturally that it can only happen, fruitful ministry can only happen when we are deeply connected to the vine with a community of faith that's deeply connected to the vine with us so that we can learn new languages, learn new cultural expressions, all that we might bear faithful witness to who Jesus is no matter where he calls us. It's only this vital, deep, remaining, abiding connection with Jesus that will allow somebody to be fruitfully, to live fruitfully, um, and incarnationally, as Jesus first de demonstrated. And it's a really, it's a reason why we love this church so much, is that together we've imagined the Lord has really revealed himself and believe that the Lord has revealed himself in Jesus. And this is what it means to be human, to live life in him. And we, together we've, we, we've understood our vision to be, to embrace people, to, to, um, glorify God, to sow seeds, and to make disciples. That this is the calling of the whole of the people of God to follow, to follow the Lord Jesus um, while we fix our eyes on him. So while I could um, highlight how several of the disciplines connect intimately with faith, um, I hope that some of them have come through in what I've been sharing. I hope you've seen that the to, sometimes we just need to get away from it all to be with Jesus in order to be formed deeply by him. Prayer is obviously a major part of it. Um, and rather than sort of reviewing the whole sermon series, just trust that that's been seen through what I've shared. But I do want to highlight one, one quick story about confession that I read in a, in a book called Blue Like Jazz several years ago. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever read this book or not, but this, actually my, my supervisor went to this university in the northwest of the United States where they had one week every year where it was just no rules. Anybody and everybody could do whatever they wanted, however they wanted. It was like, it was like sin on steroids. Um, and there was a very small minority Christian isolated group on this campus. And like, what do we do during this week? So they had this wacky idea to, in the middle of the campus, put up this, this thing like, that looked like a Catholic confession box where you go in and you confess all your sins to the priest. And so they put this up, and I don't know, whoever was the first person who finally got brave enough to step in 
He goes in and is like, all right, so how does this, how does this work? Um, and the people on the other side of the booth said, we are deeply sorry. We are sorry that we have not lived up to the vision and the beauty and the glory and the grace to what God has called us to be. Forgive us, the church, for sinning. And so in the middle of all of this sin, Juan Riled, that these people said, forgive us. We have misrepresented who God is in the world. And this, this guy went out. He's like, dude, you got to go and listen to that. That was powerful. And that's how, how confession can and, and should work as something that, that we, I think, when we're honest, we can say, Father, we've, we've missed it. We haven't been, we haven't borne well the beauty of who Jesus is to those around us. And to say, you know, whether you're looking online or sitting in this, deeply sorry for that. Please forgive us. So it's not an airing of dirty laundry or anything along those lines, but an acknowledgement of the beauty to which God has called us to in himself and to say we've got, we've got plenty of room to grow. So if there's anything that the church should be, um, it should be the chief repentance um, <laughs> agent in the world demonstrating what it looks like to say, you know what, the life is calling us to live this way. We want to live this way. And we're sorry when we're torn away from that because we haven't lived that beautiful life that you have called us to. So as we, we close this morning, um, as normal, there will be a prayer team that, that comes up and, a, and I will join that prayer team. And I would like you to seriously consider um, one of three prayers. Um, one being saying to the Lord Jesus, I want to remain in you. Whether that's for your first time or whether that's something that you've done a long, long time ago, but realize the weeds of life have just gotten in the way. Say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be first. So I would invite you to come and pray with the prayer team that prayer. But also, if there's a place in your life that is either deeply wounded or, or calloused and hard, that you come forward and say, Lord Jesus, place your hand on the, whatever part of your life is deeply hurt and wounded, that your life and spirit might transform me. But I'd also invite you to a prayer of obedience. Say, Lord Jesus, you are my everything, and I want you to do your thing through me. That you take all the gifts and all the loves and all the passions that you've given me and help me bear witness to your beauty no matter where you might send me. And, and, the, and the secret to those three prayer requests is they're really the same prayer. Faith allegiance with Jesus is healing in Jesus, is fruitful life in Jesus. And so let me pray for the worship team to come up and let you think about how you would, would come and pray as a step of faith. Father, thank you for giving us the Lord Jesus that we might have your life. Help us this morning to orient ourselves around you in him by the help and power of your Holy Spirit that you might be our everything and that your kingdom would come, that you would do your thing through us, that we might be more like you. Um, and Father, for those of us who are, are hurting and in need of a healing touch this morning, would you be pleased by your spirit and to, to help us realize that we can connect with Jesus in a way that brings life and restoration and make us fruitful. God, as we remain in you, Make us more like you, that no matter what might happen, we can always be grounded in your love and live it out well and represent you well. That all people from every nation may one day know that Jesus is Lord. We pray in his name.